Welcome everyone to the uh, first AFDCS Educational Zoom seminar. Uh, Mike is a little uh, humble. He was very prominent in putting this together, did a fabulous job in creating all the slides for me, uh, which was beyond my computer expertise. I am a self-proclaimed dinosaur in that area. Uh, the program you are going to be seeing tonight is basically in two parts. The first part, the first half of the program will be, I will be simultaneously developing uh, a brief history of first aid covers, uh, what they are and how they came about and how we came to collect them. And secondly, focusing on art on covers uh, and particularly the multicolored cachet, which we know today is the hand painted uh, cachet. It's become very prominent and uh, one of the favorite areas of collecting cachets. Uh, all of this will provide a foundation for the uh, coming on the scene of George Heinrich Laffert. Uh, he also goes by George Henry Laffert which would be an anglicized name. Uh, and we will, we will survey his amazing covers in part two. And believe me, there's gonna be some eye candy that uh, I hope you will appreciate. Uh, and we might even touch a little bit on a concept of group consciousness. I don't know if any of you have ever studied that subject or how it works, but we'll be touching a little bit uh, on that, and I approach it from a metaphysical perspective. Uh, would you please note that my email is on this, uh, on this slide. I would ask everyone who has a Laffert cover, who owns a cached cover made by George Laffert, to write down my email and sometime in the next couple of days, please send me so that I can create a little more accurate census than what we have now, but so that I can, what I would ask you to send me is the issue of your Lafford cover and the addressee, the person to whom it's addressed. That way I'll be able to uh, identify how many, how many covers of any particular issue that Laffert did. Uh, current, current thinking is that he did about five of, of each issue, but I'd like to verify that with, with as large a selection as possible. And so I ask you to help me out there. Um, next slide, please, Mike. We start with the definitions of a first aid cover, which may surprise you. At the very top, the first definition is by the American First Aid Cover Society. And a first aid cover, it's intuitively obvious what it is, a cover with the in postal indicia canceled on the first day. Very simple, right? Well. Not so much if you look at the next three definitions of what is a cover. Uh, Scott defines covers, which would include folded letters. And some of you, I, per, I, I hope, are aware of folded, folded letters, which were simply sheets of paper, primarily during the 19th century, the people would fold up, create an envelope, put a stamp on it, and that would be their envelope. But Scott also includes as a cover a postage stamp used on a postcard. Now that may surprise some of you. It did me because it's counterintuitive. And whether or not you consider a postage stamp on a postcard that's canceled on the first date, uh, whether you consider that a first date cover is 
totally up to you. As you will see, both Scott and Professor Planty would include postcards as a first day cover. Now, the AFDCS is not that broad. Their definition of a cover is an envelope that has a canceled stamp and usually one with, with philatelic interest. But the, dis the definition is restricted to an envelope. And an envelope would include a full folded letter sheet, but definitely would not include a, uh, a stamp on a postcard. And of course, the bottom is simply the very broad definition of a cachet, which is uh, which corresponds with Professor Planty as well as Scott as anything that uh, any graphic design or anything applied to the cover. Uh, and the requirement that a first day cachet should be related specifically to the stamp on the cover. Now, this, of course, would eliminate event covers, unless perhaps you can argue if the stamp is concordant with the cache and the event, then you might consider it a cache cover. But again, that's more a personal choice. And next slide, please, Mike. I want to give a thank you to Bill Gross, whose name I'm sure you all recognize for having created the most fantastic collection of classic U.S. stamps. Uh, this image comes from the book that was published by the Collectors Club of New York, which covers his exhibit, which, as you perhaps also know, won international honors, many international honors, as well as national honors. But the question is, is there a first day cover for the first issue of U.S. stamps? And the answer is simply no. This cover is the earliest use of a United States postal stamp uh, on a mail, on a cover. And it was an attorney uh, who wanted to send, and needed to send something, uh, perhaps a will or something to uh, the probate court and it's canceled on the second day, July 2, 1847. Uh, next slide, please, Bill. Uh, Mike, sorry. Um, it is of interest that during the first 229 U.S. postal issues, that is, from the first stamp in 1847 to the one cent Colombian issue, which is Scott 230. For 229 issues, we have less than half a dozen that are first day covers. These are the next two. They are from the series of 1851, both again from Mr. Gross's collection and uh, they are both from that same series, canceled on July 1, uh, 1847. Uh, the top cover is a folded letter sheet. It carries a one cent stamp, which was the carrier rate. Uh, and the second cover, the cover on the bottom uh, is Scott number uh, 10, which is the second first day cover we have from that issue. After this cover, it is veritably a desert. And I suggest, of course, that these two covers, or the, including the first one, were created accidentally. They were not created as a philatelic event. They simply were used to carry the mail and the uh, uh, accident or incidental fact of when they were canceled was irrelevant to whoever was making the cover because no one at that time was thinking of, 
of first day covers as a collectible interest. And as I mentioned, after, after these two B and before the Colombian issues, there are only two or three more covers that are incidentally canceled on the first day of issue. Next uh, slide, please, Mike. This is one of my favorite covers. It's obviously a hint <laughs> at humor. Uh, or perhaps sedition, depending on whether you're the crown or whether you're someone from Scotland. But art on envelopes was known and existed since the first issue in 1840 of the great Britain one penny black and the Mulready covers that issued at that time. The art was usually some sort of a protest or social statement, and usually a political or social issue. Uh, and the most common topic was slavery and, uh, and postal rates. This particular cover is, or relates to a dispute that the Scotch had with the Crown over the taxation of Scotch whiskey. Note the crate that he's sitting on is labeled Mountain Dew. The original Mountain Dew <clears throat> was Scotch whiskey. And notice also the position of the stamp. It would normally be in the top right corner and there's plenty of room for it on this cover, but the stamp is under the Scotchman's bottom. <clears throat> Thumbing his nose. And if any of you love Sean Connery as I do, even though he's a Welshman, you can hear him saying, kiss me bum, mum. Benny in Britain might consider this to be sedition, which is perhaps why the author's name is nowhere on the cover. Uh, the author was James uh, Walker, the son of Mrs. Walker, and the letter was just an affectionate letter to his mother. But I suggest this comes awfully close to suggestion. Next cover, please, Mike. Now I'm going to the track of color on covers and the top the top stamp is an 1881 Magnus Patriotic cover. These were very popular during the Civil War. And the cover has a black print image of the cache, which is then filled in and colored. Magnus, we are told, paid, paid people a, a one penny a cover to fill them in and, and color them. And then they were sold, of course, at a, at a little bit of a profit, and were used extensively, especially by the North during the Civil War. But the method and the importance of this particular process is something to pay attention to, because with modern covers, the method used today by cache makers like Collins, Pew, Bevel, Montgomery, uh, and even Herb Dykirk out here in California was to use, is to use a black line print and then hand color it to create a beautiful design and image. The bottom cover is an example of four color printing, only to indicate that four color printing as a process was available during the Civil War. This cover was, is in 1862, it's dated. And this is a four color printing in yellow, blue, brown, and black. Uh, and that type of printing, whether offset or lithography was available. And the question becomes, why was it used more often? And we'll, we'll take a look at the answer to that. 
That next slide, Mike. I also have a couple of covers to show you the type of color that was available during the 19th century. These two covers are from 1881 and 1882. They both have multi multicolored printed cachets. And when I use the term multicolored, I use it in its most common use, which means four or more colors. Next slide, please, Mike. Again, two examples of multicolor. These, these are in the 1880s. The top cover is printed in seven distinct colors. The bottom color is Seabury and Johnson, one of the most uh, sought after advertising covers. Uh, there's a, a sequence or a series of, of their covers is 12 color printing. The point being the technology was available if people wanted to use color. Next slide, please, Mike. As I indicated, we don't get any first day covers until the Columbian issue. But uh, the, the fair developers, I'm sure you all realize that most all of our early commemorative stamps, at least until uh, uh, through 1915, all of our commemorative st stamps were issued as political favors for the great fairs and expositions that took place and were very common around the world uh, during the end of the 19th century and the first part of the 20th century. They were used as advertising covers, the top and the bottom example from the Columbian and Trans-Mississippi series, were used as advertising covers by businessmen in the town or area where the fair was to be held. These covers would be printed, sold to the businessmen, and as you can see, they would put their corner card, their address on it, and use it as advertising and sending it to all their customers to help draw people to the fair. Very popular. The question is, why? did no one put a stamp on one of these beautiful cachet covers to create an image of beauty of a philatelic event, the first day of issue? And the answer is very simple. No one thought about it. No one considered that the first day of issue was a philatelic event and that it might be something worth collecting. The use, and for the Columbian series, uh, for example, there, there are first day covers for the, oh, excuse me, first day covers for the one cent uh, through six cent issues, the 10 cent and the $2 issue. And again, this would have been absolutely coincidental. And the reason people were putting the stamps on the cover was as a souvenir, a souvenir of the event opening day. Opening day of the fair was a big deal. And people love to brag about to their friends, I'm here at opening day. Uh, but there was no concept of a philatelic event, no concept whatsoever. Uh, next slide, please, Mike. This is just a little uh, side segue, if you will. We know the first American cached first day cover was produced by George Lynn in 1923. The question comes, 
What is the world's first cache first day cover? This, any of you who knew uh, Frederick Langford, who was a longtime member of our Reese chapter, author of a, uh, the Bible, if you will, on flag cancels. Frederick was on a 50 year quest to find the first cache first day cover for the world. This we believe is it. It is on stationary, I'm sorry, the event was the 25th anniversary of the formation of the UPU. The Universal Postal Union formed in 1874 in uh, the first part of 2000. Uh, there was a conference of international delegates to celebrate that event. The stationery was printed for the delegates by the Swiss government who held the event. And you'll notice in the lower left corner, thank you, Mike, notice in the lower left corner, the cachet which says in French, 25th anniversary of the foundation of the Universal Postal Union. That stationery was used by delegates to write letters to their friends, back to their country, whatever. Uh, and again, I suggest the fact that the cover was canceled on the first day issue of the stamps in the uh, cancellation that's right in the middle of the top you can see the date as 2700. That's February 7th, 2000. That's July 2nd, 2000. Oh, 1900. Correct. July 2nd, 1900, not 2000. Well, you know, <laughs> you're <laughs> absolutely correct. You're absolutely correct. It, the Europeans have the, yeah. uh, put the day first, the month second and the year last, uh, July 7th of 2000. 1900. Uh, 1900, yeah, well. You're only 100 years off, Bob. <laughs> I'll get there, I'll get there. In any event, the point is that the, uh, the creation, again, was incidental as there does not appear to be any philatelic intent. For example, if he was just creating a first day cover for the issue, we'd have the three stamps, not the four, which were apparently needed for the postal weight. Uh, there are three or four covers that exist uh, that, that Frederick was aware of. And as I said, he searched for 50 years to find them. There were three or four covers that had single stamps, a pair of stamps, whatever. Uh, but this was the only one he found that, that it happened to have all three on. Mm. Uh, I will be publishing an article shortly on this cover and be asking for someone to prove me wrong. I've already contacted several European dealers uh, uh, and no one has yet been able to advise me of a cache cover that is earlier in date. Next, Mike, please. For more than 25 years, almost all of the commemoratives up until the Lincoln uh, uh, and Victory commemorative were for fairs. They were produced for fairs and issued to the fairs next book. The covers that we see with first day cancels for these events uh, do not have any caches, such as this cover for the 1901 Pan American Exposition. It's an ad by Singer, sewing machines. There are 50 to 60 known, but again, and the, the first day covers that are known uh, are all on plain, plain white envelopes. Uh, again, no particular intent to create a first date cover. We know that because 
if someone wanted to intentionally or had the idea of a philatelic event, the first day cover, we would see some first day covers for the regular postage series that came between these commemorative stamps. And there literally are no covers of the postal series. The 1901 Pan American series or, or 1901 um, uh, second bureau issue, there are virtually no caches whatsoever. Uh, next, next, uh, thank you, Mike. The next uh, great exhibit was the 1903 Louisiana Purchase uh, Affair, which occurred in uh, 1904, actually. The fair was put off the day. But look at the quality of the color that was available, the multicolor printing that was available if one wanted to create a first day cover uh, or wanted to memorialize the philatelic event. These covers were printed by the Hess uh, Envelope Company in St. Louis. And they had a series of, I think perhaps 20, almost 20 different designs printed in multicolor. And they're just, they're just gorgeous. But again, the, the first day covers that exist, they were about 30, 35 first day covers for, uh, for this series. They don't have caches, extremely limited. And I suggest incidental that they have a first day cancellation. And the reason is because people were bragging about being the first at the fair. There are, by the way, several postcards Many people, uh, postcards are very popular around the turn of the century, great collectible item. And people use postcards and they did affix stamps on them. But again, if you read, if you read the messages, it's people writing and bragging saying, hey, I'm here on opening day. And they got the stamp and the cancel just to carry the mail. It was not with intent. Uh, next, please, Mike. The 1909 issue of the Lincoln stamp was a very popular release. There were postal bulletins and stories being put out in advance that a stamp would be issued to honor the 100th birthday of Abraham Lincoln. Comparison, remember I told you 35 issues of the uh, of the Louisiana Purchase by comparison, there are 508 known first day covers for the Lincoln issue. But again, none of them had caches. Now this cover has an arguably uh, related cache as the corner card for the Ladies of the Grand Army of the Republic. And it's been the painting, by the way, if you're curious, was done by Argonaise Dorian. I had her add that, add that to it. But again, there's no indication that someone was trying to intentionally create a philatelic event, the first day cover. People were getting souvenirs of the event, but there does not appear to be any intention to create a first day cover. Uh, next, Mike. Also in 1909 was the Hudson Fulton celebration. This is an advertising envelope front and back from that fair. Gorgeous cover. I mean, if any of you were alive in 1909 with the knowledge that you had now, and would you not use this cover to create a gorgeous cachet cover? Well, of course you would. But once again, 
there are no known first day cancellations or with the stamp, with the Hudson Fulton stamp on a cash and aid envelope. All of the examples uh, that we find are again on uh, clean or, or un, unprinted envelopes. Just by comparison with the Lincoln stamp, the Lincoln issue knew that we know 508, uh, 508 known first day covers. If first day cover collecting was truly an interest with the people who created the Lincoln covers, well, it slowly disappeared because there's only 152 first day cancellations known for the Hudson Fulton issue. Next uh, slide, please, Mike. Now, imagine this one just tilted so that you're looking at a diamond. It was printed, this is a souvenir folder. The original is 11 by 11. This has been reduced slightly. It's a souvenir folder for the Hudson Fulton uh, a celebration. There's a, it's printed on the back with a lot of textual information about the fair and the event. Next slide, Mike. Now, what I'm showing you here is how the fault, how that sheet, that piece of paper was intended to be and was folded to make an envelope. The bottom, which is corresponds to what you see on the top, to the triangle on the top. The bottom is folded up. The two sides are folded in. And next slide, please, Mike. The bottom could, the, the bottom was then folded up. The top triangle was folded down and inserted to make a sealed envelope. And this is what the cover looked like when it was done. Now that I would suggest is precisely what a folded letter sheet is all about. And this would fall within the definition of an envelope. The stamp happens to be canceled on September 25th, 1909, which is the first day of issue for the Hudson Fulton stamp. There is a back stamp of, uh, the next day for its delivery. So we know that that date was accurate. And what I suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, is that here is a cachet first day cover that precedes George Lynn by almost a decade. Now, I don't think we want to replace Lynn because he did his intentionally. And as I'll discuss a little bit, was a very important part in first day cover collecting. This, again, was an incidental or accidental usage of the stamp on the first day simply as a souvenir of the event and not as a first day cover. Okay, next uh, slide, please, Mike. Now, during the decade between 1910 and 1920, the same pattern that we have already seen continued, namely that the incidental first day cancellations that we see are related to commemorative stamps, the regular issued postage stamps. In this case, uh, between 1910 and 1920, we have the third bureau issue, which you know is the Washington Franklin issue. There's virtually no first day covers known for that entire series. There are very few, there are a few scattered 
First day covers here and there, according to, to Scott. The 1913 Pan Pacific Expo, there was less than 20 first day covers. Again, I say the same pattern. Some incidental first day covers for the fairs uh, and virtually nothing for the regular issue stamps. The 1919 victory stamp, which was celebratory of our victory in World War I, there are 75 to 100 first day covers known, but again, no cachet and no indication that they were intended as a philatelic event as opposed to a souvenir of the great event of the victory. This cover was issued in 1920, 1221, 1920. You can tell from the corner card who, who created it, Philip Ward whose name you probably know well as one of the uh, uh, servicers of first day covers. I would suggest to you that this is the first clearly intended intentional first day cover. Usage of the three stamps, which far pay, outpay the postal rate of two cents. You got eight cents of postage on here. There's no reason to put eight cents of postage on the envelope unless you're intending it as something else. And I suggest that Philip Ward was indeed creating a first day cover as an intentional event. And this cover, why it is significant, at least in my eyes, is the last commemorative issued before George Lynn had created his first cachet cover in 1923 for the Harding issue which was a commemorative issue uh, in, in addition to being a, a regular postal issue. I mention the value of this cover as an indication of the number of first day covers that were issued. In this case, there are less than 65 known caches for the entire issue. There are less than 20 issues known with three stamps on them. And covers with this particular corner card, which make it a very a colorful and uh, a beautiful, more beautiful than anything before. Uh, this particular cover, I believe, is somewhere between five and 10. That would be just a personal estimate from what I've seen in auction. But this cover, according to Scott, is a $3,000 cover. That indicates to you the scarcity or paucity of issues. Bob? Watch what happens. Bob? Yes. Uh, yes, I'm Roll. under the impression that there are first day covers for the Jamestown issue of 1607. Uh, Henry Shore knows more yes, about there, that. There are. It is, Roland. There it is. Uh, and yes, but that followed the exact same pattern as all of the commemorative issues uh, at that time, where the first day cover, the existence of a first day cover, was accidental, coincidental, because the people were sending letters from the fair in order to uh, uh, well, celebrate. They, they had several hundred, I think there were several hundred postcards issued and one or two of those may have also had a uh, Roland, first day canceled. Roland, I'm not gonna get into a discussion with you at this point okay. because we don't have time. 
I will, I encourage you to write to me. I've given you my email and any of you who have questions, please, I'll be glad to communicate with you on, on, on the subject. Um, Mike, please, the next, watch what happens. Watch what happens with the numbers once we get past the Pilgrim Tercentenary in 1920. The fourth Bureau series, which we know as the series of 1922, all of a sudden, these regular postal series, every single one of them, every stamp issued, both flat plate printing and rotary press printing, every stamp in the fourth Bureau series has a first day cover an intentional first day cover. These two examples, there were three people primarily, uh, Edward Warden, uh, Henry Hamelman, and Philip Ward, who intentionally serviced and created first day covers for their clients. What happened? How come all of a sudden, when we have no, literally no first day covers for any regular postal issue, how come all of a sudden in 1922 and 23, we now have first day covers? How that happened, why at that particular point in time, I don't know. But it appears when we look back on the numbers, we're going along with a fairly regular spike that's right around zero and all of a sudden, boom, up it shoots. What created that element of group consciousness that all of a sudden a first day cover is worthwhile? A first day cover is worth collecting. We can, you can explore that through different theories of group consciousness, but the simple facts are that we went from virtually nothing to large, large numbers virtually overnight. And again, comparing the dollar values, the covers produced by Hallman, Ward, Warden, most of them all have values between $100, $150, depending on the, uh, the denomination. But they're now in the range between $100 and $200 instead of in the $1,000 range. And then we get to 1923. Next slide, please, Mike. We have the first cash aid, first day covers, uh, George Lynn put together the concept of a cachet and a first day cancellation. And we have the George Lynn cover and below it is another one from the same issue. Uh, I don't know why George Lynn gets all the credit, but Broadway Stamp created a cachet for that issue also. These covers oh, un uncacheted covers for this shoe are down in a $20 range, which tells you now how many were produced. Because once from this issue forward, first day collecting exploded. You, you move on from the stamps from this issue forward, caches for profit became very popular. But again, there's no multicolored Caches, no one has yet put caches and color connected it to, to the stamps. Next, Mike, please. Until Igel Halverson came around.